Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I'm sorry, folks, but in the first part of this lecture, the microphone did not work correctly. So you were likely to see my mouth move, but you won't hear the words coming out that match because I'm doing a voiceover. So the first thing we're going to do is the slide on the goals of this lecture. The first will be to explore how our Muslims should become beekeepers gardeners and naturalists by extension and by further extension stewards of the earth to enhance our understanding of why we exist to enhance our understanding of how beekeeping supports that and finally as this is a uh, electron beekeeping to introduce you to the bees so let's get started shall we first thing we need to cover is why should muslims become beekeepers Muslims are supposed to live an intentional life, and this will help us in that direction. So, let's start at the beginning. In the name of God, the gracious, the merciful, praise be to God, the cherisher of the worlds, the intensively nurturing and caretaking, the continuously nurturing and caretaking, master of the day of judgment. I assert that the bee, that beekeeping exists between the second and fourth ayat, between the cherisher and sustainer of the world and master of the day of judgment. Between those are the words ar-Rahman, ar-Rahim. Both of these words come from the root ra ha mean, which in denotation is, means womb, but with the connotations it is to have tenderness, gentleness, kindness, to love, to have mercy, to have all that is required of beneficence. beneficence. <laughs> the womb is a place in which development into a human being occurs. It is a place of nurturing and caretaking, a time of gentleness, tenderness, mercy, and pity. Our Rahman takes the form of the root that implies intensity, and so I have <clears throat> translated that as the intensively nurturing and caretaking, while our Rahmin, Rahim, takes the root that implies continuity, and I have translated that as the continuously nurturing and caretaking. Beekeeping, like many things we do for the Great Spirit, transitions from the Great Spirit's caretaker into the world, the Great Spirit's day of judgment. We can consider this a metaphor for our post-birth life, that we should become intensively and continuously nurturing and, and caretaking. We should become a reflection of the light. We should remember that Homo sapiens was selected to be the caretaker of the earth, according to the Quran. That was part of the second goal of this lecture, to understand why we exist. So let's examine it. And the Quran says, It is he who hath made you his agents, inheritors of the earth. He hath raised you in ranks, some above others, that he may try you in the gifts he has given you. For the Lord is quick in punishment, yet he is indeed all forgiving, most merciful. I have highlighted a few words here. Agents, ranks, try, and quick. To remind us that A, we are the agents. That life is hierarchical and arranged in ranks and this is reflected in us taking care of the earth that this is a trial we will be tested on how we take care of the things and the lord is quick in punishment or very interactive the prophet peace be upon him said the world is beautiful and verdant and verily god the exalted has made you his stewards in it and he sees how you acquit yourself some of the examples of this quitting of yourself are related. As the prophet, peace be upon him, once said, If anyone wrongfully kills a sparrow or anything greater, God will question him about it. So we must be careful in the halal killing of animals for food. And while we are allowed to hunt for food, we are not allowed to hunt for sport. So again, we see that we are sandwiched between God as the cherisher and sustainer of the worlds, and God as the master of the day of judgment. Our lives are supposed to be a reflection of the graciousness and the mercy. In another hadith transmitted by Abdullah ibn Abbas, the prophet, peace be upon him, said, 
Humans are co-owners in three things, water, fire, and pasture. Basically, based on the Sadif, Muslims must hold water, fire, and pasture as part of the commons. The balance of nature is complex. If you've studied feedback loops, it is generally considered odd that nature tends toward balance. However, some of these studies fail to recognize the natural limiting factors of resource availability. All living things have a symbi symbiotic relationship, and that independence should be mutually beneficial. In this case, the butterfly is fertilizing the flowers, and the flowers are feeding the butterfly. So we hold water, fire, and pasture in common, and we are not allowed to claim them and deny them to anyone in need. They are our first responsibilities as stewards of the earth. Bees, as pollinators, also play a role in maintaining the balance of nature. And this is where we, as beekeepers, can play a role in balancing nature ourselves. Beekeeping can be considered a first step in that progression from learning to garden God's garden to being a fully informed steward of the earth. An appropriate quote from the Quran for this is, Corruption has appeared on the land and sea because of what the hands of humans have wrought, that he may make them taste a part of that which they have done, in order that they may return to guidance. Our concern for our bees expands out to become concerned for the land around us. When you start to keep bees, you become aware of the environment beyond the little piece of land you live on. Your bees were forwards up to five miles from their hive, and so you start to see plants that are blooming to feed your bees on the way to and from work. You start to tune yourself to the seasons of nectar flow, the dearth, the preparation for winter, and the emergence of spring. You start to see the necessity of uncorrupted pastures held in common with others. For now you are more than a passenger on the road to and from work. You become concerned about the overuse of pesticides that can kill your bees. You become concerned about the overuse of herbicides that kill the wildflowers that feed your bees. You become a concerned steward of your neighborhood. We can hope within our individual lives that we have learned the lesson of God's garden before the day of judgment. Keeping bees is one way we do this. In keeping bees, we can expand our souls beyond the boundaries of our purchased land. In the ayat that I quoted, we see that there is a poor relationship between Homo sapiens garden and God's garden and the great spirits nurturing and caretaking of Homo sapiens. As we are good stewards of earth, then God will be intensively and continuously nurturing and caretaking of Homo sapiens. And when we aren't, then we expect corruption to appear on the land and sea to give us a taste of what we have done to God's garden. If you want unpolluted food and water, then you must be careful in your use of herbicides and pesticides. And if you aren't, then you expect the water to become corrupted with the pesticides and herbicides. What you put on your land will not stay there. If the next rain, it's going to wash off. And the birds and the bees that land on your yard will be harmed by that. I once had a poisoning incident of my bees and it took out a large number of my hives. Praise be the God, the cherisher and sustainer of the worlds. It can surprise people when you tell them that according to the Quran, all humanity goes to heaven to be questioned on the day of judgment. And by humanity in this case, I mean all life forms of matter substrate. The birds, the bees, the cats, and of course, all dogs go to heaven as well. There is an ayat that states, And not an animal in the earth, and not a bird that flies with its wings, but are communities like you. Not have we neglected in the book of anything. Then to their Lord they will be gathered. It does not specify that this is only for humans. It means all the birds, the bees, the cats, the dogs, and all the other forms of humanity. They will all be questioned as to any injustices they may have suffered at the hands of Homo sapiens, but then they may also testify to any benefits that they received from those that have taken up their duty to become the stewards of the earth, to garden God's garden. 
So I'm hoping that by now you've got some understanding of why Muslims should become beekeepers, how it helps us to become gardeners of God's garden, and by extension, with a little practice, stewards of the earth. All of this is a way to enhance our understanding of why we, should, why we exist, why God has given us this duty. So now let's put this why of why we should become beekeepers into context. That context, extending from the little section of your backyard that, where you keep bees to the five-mile circle within which they roam and further out into the rest of the earth. We will find out that this extends past the earth, in fact. Let's point out that bees are communities, but then so are the birds, the bees, and everything else. Now, bees represent one of the highest forms of communities. On the scale of communal organization, they are actually at a level higher than homo sapiens. We should not think of any multicellular organisms, such as yourself, you're made of a huge number of cells, but that you are a host of a community of organisms. Within your gut are a lot of bacteria and fungi and other things that supply your body with their other vitamins. Um, a big example of this is also a cow. The cow has four stomachs, and in each stomach it, it grows a collection of bacteria that help it digest the cellulose in the, in the grass that it eats. We should not think of an individual as anything but a member of a larger community. We do not live as individuals, we live as an umma. So, communities tend to be members of larger communities, arrangements and arrangements. So we have our neighborhoods, which are parts of a city, which are parts of a state, which are part of a country. Um, you will find a similar effect within nature itself. And communities interact with the inorganic parts of the environment to help maintain and perpetuate the conditions of life. This is a very important part if you ever become an environmentalist or if you want to become a steward of the earth, you need to understand that. So here's some, that scale of social life forms. We have individuals and very few Things are actually individuals that live by themselves. Basically, the bacteria and the archaea, which are mainly the algaes. Next level up, we have the endosymbiotic symbiotic organisms, the eukaryota. These are the single cells that actually carry bacteria and archaea inside their own body. The parts of a plant that allow it to convert sunlight into energy, or actually single-celled algae that the plant has captured. Um, your mitochondria were once single-celled bacteria. The next level up, you have the holobiont, and one of the better examples of this is the cow. It's kind of an interesting to me thing to me that we are allowed to eat the cloven-hoofed animals, which are the chip ch coachers, and these are animals that actually have multiple stomachs and grow other bacteria in their, in their stomachs to allow them to break down grass. Uh, so again, you should never think of a multicellular organism as a single thing. It's really a community. Then we have the social groups, which basically humans are in, we live with mutually. I help you, you help me. That's one of the things uh, of Islam tries to teach you to do. The next level up, we have the youth social organisms. This is where bees lie. Um, I'll go into more detail in a minute about why youth social organisms are actually a bigger thing. And then we have the super holobion, we can think of all life on Earth as a single organism. Um, this is something that came from one of my prior religions before I was a, uh, before I reverted to Islam. 
but it is something that the scientists are discovering is very true. So, we can think of the Earth as a single life form, a super holobiont. A holobiont, again, being a multicellular organism that has a community within it. So, we see here on this what presumably is a dead log, three other organisms living on it. We have the fungi, we have the moss, and it's a little hard to see, but there's some ferns living on that. And the, capture, the camera probably did not capture a whole lot of insects that are crawling through that log, all breaking that log down so that it can feed back into the earth. If we didn't have these organisms break down, eventually the earth would be covered with miles of wood. <laughs> and nothing would then be able to get to the soil to grow. So we should think of the earth as a single organism, and we are taking care of that organism. To illustrate this, and I'm sure you can't read that, it's too small, if I took you and tried to draw a circle around you, and then said, okay, you depend on certain food plants, and I'm going to draw a line from you to those food plants. And then from the food plants to the things they depend on. And then I'm going to start taking those food plants and bringing them into that circle. And then bringing the things that those plants rely on and bringing them into the circle as well. And continue until I don't have any line of dependency crossing that circle. What we would find is eventually you would draw, well, you would have to draw that circle around the whole earth because you rely on the air. The plants recycle the air that you breathe out so that you can breathe it again. The plants collect light from the sun, so now we've got to draw that circle to include the sun. And in fact, we would need to draw that circle around the orbit of Jupiter because Jupiter helps protect the Earth from bombardment by asteroids, etc. All right. However, as Muslims, we know that that boundary must also include Allah because, as we have already seen, Allah takes care of the Earth. Allah is the cherisher and sustainer of the world. And so we cannot think of um, us as individuals. We cannot think of ourselves as just a community. We have to extend our awareness to the hope of the earth and beyond. So, in the eye of the light, his footstool doth extend over heavens and the earth, and he feels no fatigue in guarding and preserving them, for he is the most high and supreme in glory. So, that circle is going to end up having to include all of it as well. Now, this is a little hard, hard difficult diagram to see. Um, basically, this is a diagram of water with temperature and pressure. So we have ice in the blue, we have the liquid is green, and we have vapor as orange. Now the Earth is about right there, Venus is about right there, and Mars is right there, close to the triple point. Now the reason I point this out, there's another idea, I didn't put it on the slide, that basically says, all has created everything out of work. But I will read this. It is Allah who sustains the heavens and the earth, lest they cease to function. And if they should fail, there is none, not one, can sustain them thereafter. Verily, he is most forbearing, all forgiven. And I mention this because you have all heard, probably heard of global warming, right? Now, why is global warming important? Because when the earth first had life developed on it, it was, what was, it was in what was known as the Goldilocks zone. It was far enough from, away from the sun that it wasn't, um, all the seas had been vaporized like we have at Venus, and it wasn't 
so, uh, well, it wasn't so close to the sun that all the season had vaporized, but it wasn't so far that all of the water was ice. And the reason this global warming is a problem now is the Earth is no longer in the Goldilocks zone. The Earth is actually too close to the sun. The only reason we still have life on the Earth is because life on the Earth has removed a lot of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and we no longer have that strong uh, greenhouse effect and so we still, have, we still have life on the earth. However, if that life was the ever to fail, the tempter of the earth would move across this line onto a line where between Mars and Venus. It would be about right there. About 200 degrees Celsius, the oceans would boil away and there would be no way for life to exist on Earth or to return to Earth. You would never be able to create life on Earth again because it would just be too hot. Um, so it's very important for us to try to keep life alive on the Earth. So, this comes from uh, an English version. Read again, Ligio Divine. The word religion basically means to bind yourself again back to God. And the reason I bring this up is that um, by becoming a beekeeper, as I say, you become more aware of what's going on in the environment. You are operationalizing your religion. You're making, you're starting to live that intentional life where you are aware of your responsibilities and doing what you are supposed to be doing. Um, so, as individuals, assuming we take up the duty of stewardship of the environment, we would represent the intelligence of that one life, while our brain we think of as the intelligence of our body, the umma would become the intelligence of that single life, taking care of the earth trying to maintain that balance and so on. So we might have the little bees going out there and doing what they can, but we, using our intelligence, can help them out. And that's what we're going to do with the boxes and so on. But we have to, uh, even if we consider ourselves an intelligence of that one living being that the Earth represents, we have to have a due appreciation that our intelligence is just borrowed from the Great Spirit. That without that intelligence being given to us, we'd be like the gorillas and so on. So that's part of that push-pull relationship between Allah and us on taking care of things. So we covered that we are supposed to be stewards of the earth. We covered the um, beekeeping would help us operationalize our religion, or our deen, and help us under better understand why it is we are here. So let's get into the bees. That's what you came here for, right? You just kind of accepted what I've been programming on about. So. There are about 20,000 species of bees, but only 7 to 11 of them will actually produce honey. We are going to specialize, if we decide to take up beekeeping, in one of them, Apis mellifera. Apis basically is Latin for bee, mel is Latin for honey, and fera comes from the same word as fairy. Uh, something that carries something from point to point. So apis mellifera basically means honey bearing, or the honey bearing bee. Um, now I'm aware that a lot of you may have come from India or areas like that. In India, you will probably use a different species, apis serrana, which is found mainly from Japan, 
in an arc kind of down through India and then down through the islands. Now, the reason they use those is Apis Mephara doesn't live that well in those areas. There's some, you know, like the murder, murder hermits and so on that tend to kill off the Apis Mephara. There are two other species of bees that produce honey in small amounts, one in Australia and one in Mexico, but they produce only small amounts of honey because their, their whole hive is about the size of a grapefruit. <laughs> so they don't have a lot of room to store a lot of honey. Um, this bee that you're seeing here is an orchard bee, and it looks like he's on the, um, either an apple or a pear tree flower. Uh, an orchard bee is an individual bee. It actually lives individually and doesn't produce honey. Now, one of the surahs of the Quran is actually named after the honeybee, the 16th surah. And I had 63, if I remember correctly. And your Lord taught, Lord taught the honeybee to build its cells in hills, on trees, and in men's habitations than to eat of all the produce of the earth and find her skill the spaces pass of its floor. The issues from within their bodies a drink of varying colors wherein is hearing to men, to men. Verily in this is a sign for those who give thought. Um, this ayat basically says we ought to start studying the bees to learn from them. They actually have a higher social uh, version than we do. So let's go into that. This is what is known as a bee wall. This is from a garden somewhere in um, Ireland, if I remember correctly. Um, so, and your Lord taught the honeybee to build itself in hills, on trees, and in men's habitations. This is part of what would be called a wall garden which is an interesting thing because the word paradise actually comes from the Persian, para meaning around and dice meaning wall, paradise meaning a walled garden. And someone decided to build themselves a walled garden and have bees within it. Now you can see a little skep here. This is uh, an old fashioned version of keeping bees that is not allowed in the United States. But each of these holes would have a scalp within it and typically would be covered with a board to help protect them in the winter. So let's go back to bees. They are a social organism living in large numbers and cannot survive as individuals. Your goal as a beekeeper is not to keep the individual bees alive. Your goal is to keep the whole hive alive as a single unit, the hive itself. The bees have a coordinated cooperation and create structures within the hive within to live. They control the environment within that structure, and like we use air conditioning or heating in the winter. Okay, there's separation of concerns. The different ages of bees, they do different things. And the social system and the individuals evolve together. They don't, you don't have individual bees evolving. Uh, it's the whole system has to evolve. So, age-dependent duties. An adult bee, for the first two days of its life, just cleans the hive. The first thing it's going to clean is the cell it came out of. Then from 3 to 11 days, it's going to feed the larva. On 12 to 17 days, it produces comb and processes the nectar that's brought back in. Then for 3 days, 18 to 21, it's actually where it emerged from the hive. Until that time, it hasn't come outside of the hive. Um, the first day it's going to come out of the hive and it's going to fly in a little old figure eight in front of that hive, memorizing what that hive looks like. And then after it'll go back in. The next day it'll come out and it'll fly a little farther away. 
memorizing that high, where that hive is in relation to its environment. And it gets farther and farther away until from about 21 days on, it's going out and looking for food and bringing that food back. And you might notice that there is a reverse movement of food within the hive. The odor of bees forwards for supplies, they bring it back. The younger bees process it and process the nectar, and even younger bees use that food to feed the even younger bees, the ones that haven't actually become adults yet. So, then we have frames. And before you see a bee as an adult bee, it starts off as a little bitty egg. It takes three days for that egg to hatch, and then it will swim around, there will be an egg in each one of these cells, and it will swim around inside the cell and the food that the nurse bees deposit in that cell. And that's how it grows for a while. It would do that for 10 days. Then you have, it'll form a cocoon, and the older bees that build the cells will Covered up. So these right, this right here is the capped brood. The area in the middle here, this football-like shape, is where there had been some capped brood, but they've come back out. And then you see over here, this is your honey. And as I said, the bees form structures in the hive, and they were put the eggs in the middle of that hive and build honey around the outside so that it forms a, a bit of insulation in the winter. And then you can see some cells right here that kind of poke up a little bit. That's going to be male bees. There won't be many male bees. A hive is typically 99% female. And you only have males during spring. The rest of the year, there will be no male bees in that hive. Because the, the male bee has one duty, and he dies doing it. <laughs> so, uh, let's go to the next slide here. Here, and hopefully you can see this, you have the larva. You got some smaller larvas, bigger larva. They get really big and they form the cocoon and get capped. And maybe you see an egg down in here. So this is basically the life cycle of the bee, from egg to adult to going out to the harvest. And again, you're not trying to keep individual bees alive, you're trying to keep the whole hive alive. So let's play find queen. There's one bee in a hive that lays all the eggs. She will lay up to 2,500 eggs a day. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> in fact, the volume of all those eggs will be larger than she is, and way more than she does. So what? That's part of why there's that separation of concern. You got all those bees that go out collecting food, and their job is to feed her and everybody else, for that matter. Um, now, here's the queen. It's got a little spot on the back. Some beekeepers will mark the queens. It makes them easier to find because for, they kind of all look the same. So she has a longer thorax, as you can see here, that extends past the wings. Where the workers, the wings are about the same length as the thorax. That allows her to stick that thorax down in those cells and then lay that head. And the, her daughters, these are all females, will take care of those eggs for her. Um, so again, you're trying to keep that hive alive, you're trying to keep that queen alive. But all the other workers are trying to keep her alive too. And you can't buy just, well, you can't actually buy just the queen, but she won't survive by herself. She has to have 
thousands of attendants. Now, case, occasionally, the queen will die, and you have to have new queens, because a queen will last from three to five years. Um, this is the queen cell. You notice it's a little longer than all the other cells, because she's a little longer herself. And here you have one off the base of the hive, and there may be one here. I'm not sure whether that's the queen cell or not. Um, these would be called swarm cells. Um, if you find a queen cell in the middle of your frame, I hate to tell you, but your queen has died and they're trying to create a new one. Um, so that's one way of, of knowing if there's something messed up in your hive. If you find a queen cell in the middle of a frame, your queen's dead. And they're trying to create a new one. But if you find queen cells on the bottom of the frame, they're getting ready to swarm. Now, what swarming means is that when this queen is about ready to emerge, the oak queen and about half the workers are going to fly away. And she's going to leave this oak new queen behind to continue the hive. And that's how the hive reproduces. The old queen and about half the workers fly away and they look for a new place to create a new hive. And so that's hive reproduction. Otherwise, eventually the queen's going to die and then the hive dies, right? So that's the queen. You've seen the workers. And that's a drone, the male bee. The queen can decide to create a male bee when she wants to. And she does this by laying an egg that is unfertilized. All male, all male honeybees are happily. They have half as many chromosomes as the females. Um, you can identify a drone, as you saw the bigger the bigger cell that has a little dome on it. So they're a little bigger than a worker, and they're pretty much all eye. The, their head is almost totally eye. Okay, now, again, drones were only, the queen were only create male bees in the spring, because that's when all the flowers are blooming and they have the best chance of going and creating a new hive. And they're leaving behind a new queen, and she has to go out, and she has three days of having sex. Only three days. After that three days, she goes back into the hive, and she will lay eggs for the rest of her life. Okay? And as I said, the, the male bee has only one job, and that is to fertilize the queen, and he will die in that process. Um, the little part of the body of the bee that allows the, the queen to lay eggs is the same part of the body that allows the females to sting you, and it's also the same part of the body that allows him to have sex with the queen. And like the uh, female stinging you, when it pulls away, it pulls out, it leaves the stinger behind and has, you know, and that sting will stay in your skin. But the bee, the queen will die, not the queen, the worker will die when she stings you. And so, yes, you will get stung, but because the, the, the bee dies when it stings you, they tend not to do that that much. They try not to, unless they're Africanized. The Africanized bees will sting you. Uh, no but you have to kind of get them mad first. So here is a landed swarm. Somewhere in the middle of that swarm will be the queen. And this is one way that you can um, get yourself bees. Uh, last year I had a huge drought. I didn't get any rain from April to November. Well, I got like a quarter of an inch in those nearly six months. And um, a lot of my hives didn't make it through the winter. So, come February, February's warm. I decide, okay, I'm going to feed 
my bees real heavy and see if I can make splits, get them to produce those queen cells and then split them out. You know, take the queen cell out, take a bunch of the worker bees out, start a new hive. Well, March turns cold. And bees are warm blooded. They keep that hive warm. Okay. And if I had opened the hive during that cold weather, I would have killed off my brood, so I wouldn't open the hive. And every time we had a warm day in, in March, I'd have a swarm pop out. <laughs> because they were just waiting to be able to go and, and start a new hive. So, my wife, when we have a swarm, we start ringing a bell. And what that does is it tells those bees to land somewhere. And once they land, you can collect them and put them in a box. And that's one way of, of making a new hive. And I went from one hive at the beginning of March to eight by the end of, well, the first week of April. And I actually bought a couple of packages because I wasn't sure if that one hive was going to make it. So there are basically four ways of getting bees. You can get a package, which is about three pounds of workers and a queen. You can buy a nuke, which is five frames. I have a nuke box back there, in which I'll show it to you in a bit. Um, A uh, nuke is much more guaranteed to help you get a, uh, a hive going because it's already got the five frames in there to establish a little brood. You basically take those five frames out, put it in another box, add some more frames, and, look, and feed it up so they will grow and fill it out. But you can buy a full hive, um, or you can capture a swarm. And as I said, I bought two packages of these in January. You order your bees the first week of January. By the second week of January, they'll be sold out. Um, and you can either order a package or you buy a nucleus. Now, I order a package because I already had old hives with uh, frames and all built out. And again, I captured five swarms this year. Six. Five. five or six. So this is my bee yard with my hives. As you can see, I now have eight hives. They are various sizes. This one was the, the one that made it through the winter. The first swarm went into this one, and it's had some problems with it tried to swarm again, and I split it up. And these four are from that the swarming problem I had. These two are from the packages. And this one's having problems right now. I don't know why. I've lost two queens so far in that hive. Um, that's one of the things of taking care of bees. If you take care of bees, I suggest starting with two hives. If one of them dies, you, you try to make the other one split, and then you're back to the two hives. So, uh, sorry, you can't really read this. A hive represents a super organism. As I said, you don't keep a single bee alive, you keep the whole hive alive. The hive acts like an organism itself. And in the living system theory of James Weir Miller, every matter-based life form has a structural organization that you are going to supply parts of that organization for the bees. You're going to buy, supply the hive box, you're going to supply frames, uh, you should supply wax, ventilation, and insulation. Now, one very important idea, concept of all that, is boundaries. We know of, of paradise as a wall of garden, it has a boundary around it. We have houses, we have the walls of your house represent a boundary. We take it so far, we have rooms inside the house. And the idea is that the environment inside the boundary is organized 
based on what you want to do. You have a different organization of your bedroom than you have of your kitchen, right? And so that concept of boundary is very important. You, you will see it all over the place. We have nations, they have their boundaries and try to build a wall around it. Uh, so it allows them to manipulate the environment inside that boundary. Bees are warm-blooded. Unlike most insects, bees maintain their temperature, that is, their body temperature around a certain range. And in the winter, they will maintain it around 52 degrees. At least the bees that you're probably going to get. The Africanized bees actually maintain their temperature around 55 degrees. And because of that, they go through their winter stores a lot faster, and it helps them. They can only grow in cooler areas. In the summer, they will keep their temperature around 90 degrees. And this is important. As I said, if I had opened my eyes during uh, the cold weather, I would have killed off my brood. Um, they eat the honey that they collected during the spring to then keep the hive warm. Uh, they will also control the humidity within the hive. They collect the nectar. The nectar is 5% sugar and 95% water. Honey itself is um, about 19% water. So they have to evaporate all that water. And again, they're keeping the brood warm down here. They've got the honey above it. That warm air rises up through that nectar and dries it out. And it escapes through the top of the hive. And they're going to create a structure within that hive. In the winter, they're all clustered, kind of like that. You saw that uh, swarm that clustered. They do that in the winter and try to keep the queen warm. But in the summer, they spread back out. They start building out the frames. They start collecting nectar and creating bee bread. And your goal, one of your goals, will be to get them to put the honey in an easily accessible place, <laughs> okay? You don't want brew mixed up with your honey because then it's hard to harvest your, your honey. So, within the U.S., all hives have to be inspectable. There is a disease within the United States that tends to kill off uh, hives. It will kill off the whole hive. And if you find your hive is, has that disease in there, you are required to literally burn your hive. Um, thankfully, because of years of doing that, that fungus is relatively rare now. But the law is still on the books and you still have to have a modular hive. Now, people have supplied these are a boundary for thousands of years. You can see in here we have another bee wall they got little clay tubes. They put a wood disc on the front and the back, and they have the honey, the bees living inside that tube. Um, other things are clay pots turned upside down, or in Europe they use straw baskets, and they would literally have to um, squeeze them <laughs> to get the honey and wax out. Okay, I'm going to stop for a minute while my wife changes the battery in the All right, so migrant beekeeping, which is where you move your hives from place to place following the flowers, has been practiced for some 4,500 years. They would literally load the beehives on the barge on the Nile and move it up and down as the flowers were blooming. In fact, the uh, symbol, the hieroglyphic symbol for the pharaoh of the lower part of the Nile was a beekeeper. So in Mexico, Mexico, they keep their bees in ceramic pots. And again, as I said, they produce really bitty um, hives. And so, as you can see here, this guy has a large number of bees or hives. And they're basically 
two pots turned upside down. You can take a closer look at this. Oop, wrong direction. Uh, you have an opening for the leaves to come out, and two, high, two pots turn on top of each other.
trying to dry out their uh, nectar. Here's a better view of it. You can get something you put in this hole that lets the bees go in one direction. And so if you have a honey super, you put the top frame on it, put the bee excluder on it, put some stinky stuff at the bottom and the bees will come up. And then where you, you can harvest your honey or fowl pally and a lot of bees in there. Because they were all like to stick around and protect their honey. Okay, you have this little mortise. You always place this mortise pointing to the front of the hive. And in the winter, you would push the cover, uh, let me show you the inner cover, the outer cover. You would push the outer cover backwards so that it kind of blocks that hole. And in the summer, you push it forward so that air can come out of that hole a lot easier. This cover has metal on it to protect it from the rain. This is a standard Langstrom hive that home beekeepers will typically use. When we do the show and tell of the new box, I'll show you a different type of cover that is used for when you're putting all your hives in a truck and you're carting them to somewhere else. So, again, we got to the end of the thing. And one point I want to make of all this is that you will want to build a strong base or hot stand. Uh, 50 pounds there, 50 pounds there. A medium full of honey will weigh a little over 70 pounds. So three full pound, three full honey, medium honey supers is 210 pounds. So that hive is going to weigh about 330 pounds, somewhere around there. Um, if you have several of them, that becomes kind of heavy. <laughs> so you want to build a strong base. Um, now, my wife Ted says I get a little. people's heads on some of this stuff. So, if you got any questions, would you like to ask me a question, raise your hand. Don't be shy. Anything in there that didn't make any sense to you? Yes. So the, the Mexican um, clay pots? Yeah. Is there a queen in each one of those? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, there's always going to be one queen to lay eggs. Now, in one of the earlier slides, you know, it says they grew in the hills. It is thought that these evolved in caves. And within a cave, you can have all, you know, a whole bunch of, of honeycomb. And you might have multiple queens in that. You know, they're kind of separated by distance. If you've ever seen a case of a house where an old abandoned house, they get bees up in the attic, you may have five or six queens in, in the attic of a house because they've built enough space and the queens don't get close enough to each other to start fighting. But um, what you're going to try to maintain is one queen per box. In this case, I have eight queens, and I keep them in wooden boxes in my backyard. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? Um, how many more classes would we take before we could start our own class? How many classes would you take? What I would suggest is you come out once every two weeks until you feel comfortable with them. You will start your hives in the spring. I'm not going to start a hive in the, in the summer or the winter. You're going to start a hive in the, in the spring. And so you would come out for, um, I will probably harvest my honey at the end of June. So I've got like four or five more times for folks to come out and learn. Um, and of course, you would probably want to come back next spring. There's a lot to learn about bees. I just covered the, the basics. You know, you've got diseases, you've got 
parasites, you've got all sorts of other things that you might want to eventually study. Yes? Um, you may want to point out that the real challenge in beekeeping comes after you have harvested the honey. Yes. You're managing them. So when he mentors you, you need to come out. When he says he's going to open the hives, for a full year probably, mm -hmm. to see every stage right. of, of the care. Um, as I said, you, you become aware of the seasons. In the winter, the bees cluster up and you may not do much with them. In fact, you're, not gonna, you're probably not going to open that hive. One of the things the bees will do is they will collect sap from trees and they will glue that hive shut and fill all the little holes with, with what's called propios. And if you break the seal on that hive, and then you create drafts and it makes it harder for them to survive. So you won't go into your hive into, in the winter. Once it starts warming up though, you need to go into your hive pretty often just to make sure that they're not swarming or getting ready to swarm or like, you know, I made a mistake of feeding them more heavily in February and then it turned cold in March and every warm day a swarm popped out. <laughs> okay. So, the spring flower flow lasts until about the end of June here. In the farther north, it goes a little later in the season. Down in Florida, you would get flowers all year long. And so, you could take care of these all year long. That's why also one of the reasons Florida has a problem with the Africanized bees. They produce a much smaller hive, they swarm more often, and they, they work much harder at protecting them. <laughs> That's why they tend to be aggressive. Um, and they run at a slightly higher temperature that makes them faster. Okay. But when the dearth starts, again, you won't go into your hive very often because now they've collected pretty much all the food they're going to collect for the year. They have to make that food last all the way to the next spring. And what you are doing is you're collecting what you consider the excess. You need to leave every hive with about 30 pounds of honey for them to make it to the next spring. Okay. Above that 30 pounds of honey, you can collect it, but you probably want to fit also feed your bees. If you look right, right here, see that little orange thing? That's a feeder where I feed that hive of sugar water, white sugar. If you feed them brown sugar, they'll get diarrhea. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, since I'm trying to get these hives to grow quickly, I'm feeding them. Um, and as I say, this middle hive is giving me fits because I've lost two queens in it for some reason so far this year. Uh, I did notice they had an orientation dance this today, so maybe I've got a queen that survived in there and she's producing brood and they're, they've gotten to the age where they're coming out and they're trying to, you know, they're flying back and forth and they're looking at their hive and memorizing where their hive is. They will learn that their hive is the one in the middle, not the one on the edges, and they will come back to that middle hive. The folks that come out and on the edge hives, they learn their hive is on the edge. Bees actually do learn quite well. They will learn you. They will learn your face. So be nice to them because if you aren't nice to them, they learn you aren't nice. <laughs> Can I, you have a question? Yeah, I did. Um, how does a new queen like come about? How does a new queen what? Come about. Like, are they just born queens? Or? All right. So, everybody thinks um, the queen is fed something called warrior jelly, which is a slightly different food from the other workers. And they used to think that the, the workers put something extra in the food for the queens. And they, this last year, they figured out in actuality they leave something out. That if you leave that chemical out, that bee will develop into a queen. And 
evolutionally, that's actually more fits evolution there because you know at one time they were pretty much all queens. <laughs> so if you lose your queen, you go into another hive, find a frame with some eggs. The eggs, as I say, they hatch within three days, and so. You put that frame with young eggs, hopefully freshly laid egg, into the hive without a queen. The workers will pick one of those eggs and stick it in a cell, create themselves a queen cell, stick that egg in there, and feed it oil or jelly. Okay? And that bee will develop into a queen. So as you saw those queen cells, that's where they're taking some of their, the, the regular eggs and they stuck them in there and they're saying, you get to be a queen. Okay, now, the reality is that normally the queen is the only one to lay an egg, but occasionally you will get a worker that will try to lay eggs. And since a worker has never had sex, the worker's eggs will all become nails. And what happens then is you don't have any females, they don't have to lay any more eggs, eventually that hive is going to die out once those existing um, worker bees get too old and die out, there are no, no more worker bees, all you have in there are drones, and so that hive will die out. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. During the heavy rain, the heavy rain, what will happen to the hole of the cover? Of the heavy rain? Yeah. The water rips off the edge. You not destroy the water inside? Well, that's the whole concept. Uh, you really can't see it, but I have these hives tilted a little so that they drain. Um, if I, I think this hive has a solid bottom board, and if it tilted backwards, that water would drain into the hive and it'd make it. You know, it could fill up the bottom of the hive and they couldn't get out. So you, you tilt it slightly so that the water can roll drain forward. Now, as I say, I tend to run screen bottom boards and that's going to drain out anyway. So it would be better to have a shed. A shed? Um, I yes. Have shed. I have shed. Yes. Um, you saw that bee wall from Ireland where literally the hive was inside a hole in the wall. Of course, that wasn't going to get rained on, which is good because that was a basket. The basket would eventually brought out. Um, well, looking small. Um, any other questions? Yes? How long do they live? How long do they live? OK, you saw the slide on eggs. It takes about 21 days for to go from an egg to an adult. And then it takes another 21 days for them to start going out of the hive, okay? And as I said, they will then work themselves to death. All right, now during the winter, because it's cold, they slow down. They don't go outside of the hive, they don't beat themselves up. So the bees that you enter winter with they're going to last till spring. But the bees in the summer, they may last a week after they start foraging. And literally, they will work themselves until they can't make it back to the hive. You're, you're find little bees walking around the ground sometimes, or they, they actually have gotten so beat up they can't make it fly back up to the hive. Um, so, okay. 21 days before they become an adult, another 21 days before they start flying around, and who knows how long at that point. Um, the queen, on the other hand, will last from three to five years. After about three years, though, she starts running out of eggs. Or actually, she starts running out of something else and can't fertilize her eggs. So her egg production drops. And most beekeepers will um, replace the queen after two to three years instead of leaving her. Now, the one in this hive, what 
of the reasons I had a little problem with it is during COVID, I couldn't get new queens. And so she was nearly five years old. Um, and she died. I ended up with a, you know, a queen cell in the middle of her frame. And that's how I knew she had died. And so uh, this one is trying to rebuild because, okay, the queen emerges. It takes her, you know, she's actually in a cocoon longer than the workers. It takes her longer to develop. She's larger than some other thing. It takes her longer to develop. Then she's got to lay eggs. They've got to develop. So if you lose your queen, you got about two months before you're actually going to be back up to full strength. I think uh, if you, we can continue with the questions on the WhatsApp group, uh, we can discuss more, we can have uh, more learning. Uh, but right now, uh, since we have the setup on the back, we can go and have a look at the, uh, you know, the equipment and the gear. So I'll be there and Charlie will be there and you can, uh, you can actually see, you know, hold it and see. So how we are going to see that? Uh, all together or the brothers are going to see first? Partners and that sister can do that. Yeah, so I think sisters. Oh, let sisters do it first. Yeah, let sisters. Yeah, sister Lisa can. Yeah. If you, if you finish, and then we can come. So teach them well. Say what? Teach them well. Teach what well? So he just asked you to show the the sh do the show and tell for the one. All right, I'm deaf. You have oh, to yeah, really okay. yell at me. Okay. <laughs>